Good morning and welcome everyone on behalf of uh, Dr. Simpson, who is out today. Welcome to Grand Rounds. It's that time of year when we are wowed by our uh, medical students. Uh, keep in mind, uh, the four talks you're about to hear have had more preparation than any four talks anyone else will give uh, the rest of the year. Um, they, they, of course, are excited um, and ready to put their best foot forward, and we're, we're all excited as well. Uh, one announcement for faculty, we are doing beta testing of our yellow sheets, and these are the virtual yellow sheets. Uh, there's an iPad with a yellow cover. We still want you to continue to use the regular yellow sheets if you do have feedback. Um, you can funnel that feedback to me if you just need a quick email to send it to, and I can get it to Ann. Uh, you can also send that to Ann Brady. Uh, or Judith Warner as we go through the beta test uh, process. Uh, so I'll be turning it uh, time over to Ashley, who will be uh, our resident, Ashley Polsky, who will be uh, doing our introductions and uh, moderating our session. Thanks, Dr. Petty. Thank you everyone for coming to Grand Rounds today. Um, we have four really awesome medical students who are gonna be presenting. Um, first up is Anikit Ramshekar. Um, Anikit is a fourth year MD PhD student at University of Utah School of Medicine. Um, and a fun fact about Anikit is that he loves to garden. And if you stick around to the end of his presentation, you may or may not be seeing some photos of some of his favorite plants. <laughs> so um, Anikit is going to be presenting some of his PhD research titled The Role of Erythropoietin Receptor Signaling in Choroidal Neovascularization. Thank you, Ashley, for that wonderful introduction. Can people on Zoom hear okay if they can drop a chat? And can people in the audience hear me okay? Excellent. With further ado, this project was one of the projects I did during my graduate phase of my training, and it focused on age-related macular degeneration, which is a leading cause of central vision loss worldwide. Project specifically focused on two advanced forms, atrophic and neovascular. Shown here are some color fundus images representing neovascular on the left and atrophic AMD on the right. The question that we asked looking at these fundus images is how do we prevent progression of AMD to these advanced forms? At the time of this project, when it was still in the design phase, erythropoietin was being explored as a potential therapeutic target to slow progression of atrophic AMD. Erythropoietin or EPO is a hematopoietic hormone and it has no neuroprotective um, ability on retinal neuronal cells and vascular cells in the eye. EPO also has antioxidant and anti-inflammatory effects, which are key signaling cascades implicated in AMD pathology. A retrospective pilot study conducted in 2014 found that off-label use of intravitreal EPO slowed progression of geographic atrophy expansion and vision loss in AMD. Taken together, EPO was postulated to be a potential therapeutic target to reduce the progression of atrophic AMD. However, when we reviewed literature, we also found evidence to support the notion that erythropoietin is also implicated in neovascular AMD. One study found an elderly patient with active CNV had increased serum EPO levels compared to age-matched patients with inactive CNV. Studies have also demonstrated erythropoietin signaling primarily through its receptor, erythropoietin receptor, or EPO-R, is implicated in angiogenesis. Erythropoietin receptor canonically signals through the JAK-STAT signaling cascade. And looking at single-cell RNA-seq data from um, eyes from Rob Mullen's lab, erythropoietin receptor was expressed in choriocapillaris. Taken together, this supported the notion that EPO 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 -R signaling is involved in the progression of neovascular AMD and raises the concern regarding the use of EPO in an atrophic AMD. So this led us to postulate, is erythropoietin receptor signaling increasing the development of choroidal neovascularization by direct effects on choroidal endothelial cells that line the choriocapillaris? To put it in a graphical abstract, we postulated that EPO by binding to erythropoietin receptor on choroidal endothelial cells leads to downstream STAT activation to ultimately lead to choroidal neovascularization. The first question we wanted to address was, is EPO-R functional in choroidal endothelial cells? To address this, we isolated choroidal endothelial cells from adult human donor eyes 
from Utah Lines iBank. We ensure that they are endothelial in origin uh, by ensuring endothelial marker expression, such as CD31 and von Willebrand factor. And we repeated experiments using choroidal endothelial cells isolated from three different donors to enhance the rigor of our study. The first experiment we performed using these isolated choroidal endothelial cells was treating control choroidal endothelial cells with saline, PBS, vascular endothelial cell growth factor as the positive control, and then erythropoietin. In control cells, we and then we measured phosphorylation of STAT3 as a downstream outcome. What we found was, as we would expect, PBS did not activate relatively as much STAT3 compared to the positive control vascular endothelial cell growth factor, but then erythropoietin did also increase STAT3 activation, supporting the notion that EPO, EPOR signaling exists in choroidal endothelial cells. To enhance the rigor of this finding, we knocked down expression of erythropoietin receptor, which reduced EPO-induced STAT3 activation. We quantified that across independent experiments using uh, cells from different donors, and we did find a significant reduction in EPO-induced STAT3 activation in cells that had EPO-R levels uh, reduced. Returning back to the hypothetical framework, our results from cell culture supported that EPO-R was expressed and is functional in choroidal endothelial cells. And now what our question was, what is the role of EPO-R in choroidal neovascularization? To address this part of the project, we used two models in the mouse model. One was a laser-induced choroidal neovascularization, and the other was a transgenic knockout mouse. And I'll walk through both those models coming up here. So the murine laser-induced CNV model or choroidal neovascularization model allows us to um, perform laser-induced injury to the back of the eye, specifically at the RPE Brooks membrane, which stresses those surrounding cells to release angiogenic inflammatory and oxidative factors to ultimately lead to pathology similar to what is seen in neovascular AMD patients termed choroidal neovascularization. And as mentioned, it recapitulates the inflammatory and oxidative angiogenic factors, and it's a relatively rapid development of CNV, making it an ideal translational model to study choroidal neovascularization. And, and now the second model we used in the choroidal neovascularization were transgenic mouse models, wherein it was an endothelial-specific erythropoietin receptor knockout. So I'll first walk through the bottom row here, which is our experimental animal. And these animals express Cre recombinase, which is an enzyme that specifically deletes genes that are flanked by LOX-P sequences. And this Cre recombinase was conjugated to estrogen receptor so that it's inactive until tamoxifen is administered. And it's under the guidance of a CDH5 promoter so that Cre recombinase is only expressed in endothelial cells and no other cells. So when we go ahead and inject tamoxifen to activate Cre recombinase, it deletes essential exons in erythropoietin receptor so that it knocks out erythropoietin receptor in endothelial cells. And then as a positive outcome of Cree recombinase activity, we also had a TD tomato reporter to show the fluorescence in cells that had positive Cree recombinase activity. Our control animals lack Cree recombinase and therefore continue to express erythropoietin in endothelial cells even after tamoxifen. And shown here are some fluorescent fundus images demonstrating that our experimental animal had the TD tomato fluorescence in endothelial cells lining the retinal vessels here, whereas our control did not. Combining the two models, what we found was that animals that had erythropoietin receptor knocked out in endothelial cells had significantly reduced choroidal neovascularization volume compared to littermate control animals that continue to express erythropoietin. Returning back to our central framework, it supported the notion that erythropoietin receptor is necessary for the development of choroidal neovascularization. So to summarize, our data suggests that erythropoietin receptor signaling is involved in the development of choroidal neovascularization, and it raises an important point in that balance of future treatment to prevent not only the progression of atrophic AMD, but also neovascular AMD. Some ways in which this might be possible is perhaps through cell-specific treatment, wherein we only activate signaling cascades in specific cell types. In the case of erythropoietin, perhaps only activating erythropoietin signaling in retinal neuronal uh, cells. Or even perhaps co-treatment with the gold standard for neovascular AMD anti-VEGF agents in combinations with EPO, for example, for atrophic AMD. 
With that, I have a lot of people to thank, but especially Dr. Hartnett and her lab for providing me the opportunity to perform this project, collaborators who performed essential reagents to make this project possible, my MD-PhD advisors, especially Dr. Bernstein, other academic advisors, Dr. Petty and Dr. Jardine, and of course, the Moran Eye Center and Chandler for allowing me the opportunity to present today um, at Grand Rounds and organizing our sub -I. With that, thank you all for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions about the project or the pictures of plants that you see here. This question may not make sense, but with the, you showed a positive, you showed a control where you, where with anti, with VEGF, that it was also knocked, when you did it, EPO, you knocked that. So what's the crosstalk and what happens if you knock out, or what happens to the VEGF pathway? What's the interaction really between VEGF and That's EPO? an excellent question. So to repeat the question to those who are on Zoom, the question was, why does, um, VEGF treatment also um, not induce death reactivation when EPO-R was knocked down. Uh, when looking into literature, there are receptor like beta common receptor that link VEGF receptor with EPO-R receptor. And we postulate that might be a connection between two different receptor signaling cascades and why we might be seeing this data. Um, there are ongoing research um, to knock out or knock down uh, beta common receptor, for example, and see if that could be a possible link. But those experiments are still ongoing. And if you knock out the VEGF receptor, does EPO work? You know, what happens on that? That's an excellent question. We haven't tested that, and I'm not sure of literature that has looked at that quite yet. Um, if I were to postulate based on the data, it might still be reduction. We do know when we knock down VEGF receptor uh, 2 or KDR, we do see that VEGF induced stat 3 activation is reduced. Uh, but the EPO part of it, I would postulate, would also be reduced. Any other questions? Okay, great job, Anna Kit. Um, next up is Michael Jensen. Um, Michael is a fourth year medical student also at the University of Utah School of Medicine. Um, and before Michael was a medical student and aspiring ophthalmologist, uh, he actually danced for Ballet West as a kid. Um, so if you stick around to the end of his presentation, he may show you some dance moves. <laughs> no, just kidding, Michael. Um, Michael is going to be presenting a case titled Bilateral Giant Cell Arteritis. All right, good morning, everybody. Um, as Ashley said, I'm Michael Jensen, fourth year student here at the U. I'm really excited to present this case to you today that came through our consult service. So let's go ahead and jump right in. Um, 80 year old white male with history of polymyalgia rheumatica presents to his primary ophthalmologist at an outside hospital with complaint of intermittent diplopia. He says that it started a few days ago and that it comes and goes. He's not sure if it's horizontal or vertical. Um, and it's associated with graying vision, especially when looking up at traffic lights. On review of systems, he reports a severe bitemporal headache and scalp tenderness for the past month and states that it's partially responsive to opioids. Um, he also has proximal, proximal muscle pain and weakness, uh, decrease or increased malaise, night sweats, throat and ear pain, though he denies jaw or tongue pain, uh, no fever and no weight loss. As I mentioned, he has polymyalgia rheumatica. This was diagnosed in January of 2023 and recently started tapering his steroid dose. He has coronary artery disease, heart failure, hypertension, and had a stent placed uh, in October of last year. And he was in a car accident of April, 2023 and head CT was normal. Um, this past medical history plays an important part in um, 
ultimately deciding to seek care later on that we'll talk about. He's also pseudophagic and uh, has age-related macular degeneration. On exam, he has scalp tenderness and prominent temporal arteries bilaterally. His eye exam is pretty baseline and unremarkable. His visual acuity is 2040, 2050, which is baseline for him. There's no diplopia, no APD. Uh, the visual field um, are full and uh, extra, as well as the extraocular movements. And uh, there's no optic nerve pallor or edema noted on exam. At this point, given the patient's age, history of PMR, um, temporal headaches, scalp tenderness, prominent temporal arteries, and some vision changes, the most likely diagnosis was thought to be giant cell arteritis, the, um, though other causes um, in the differential could be like an intracranial lesion, a mass hemorrhage, or migraine, or NAION. With that most likely diagnosis in mind, ESR, CRP, and CBC were ordered. A referral was placed to oculoplastics for an emergent temporal artery biopsy, and his steroid dose was increased to 80 milligrams. So, so far, pretty straightforward um, routine case of giant cell arteritis, most likely. On day two, the patient goes uh, to get his temporal artery biopsy that morning and reports that he had a sudden decrease in vision last night, night prior, after taking his steroids. On exam, his vision is now counting fingers in both eyes. He has mild optic nerve pallor and edema. Um, his ESR, CRP, and platelets are both elevated. And it was at this point that the patient was transferred to the University of Utah Hospital for uh, further workup and management. And while being seen by our team here and being admitted, temporal artery biopsy came back positive, confirming the diagnosis of giant cell arteritis. Um, below is a picture of an example uh, biopsy. On the left is a normal temporal artery. You can see an intact internal elastic lamina, normal thickness of the various layers of the vessel wall and a nice wide lumen. On the right, you can see that the internal elastic lamina is almost completely obliterated. There's pretty impressive hyperplasia of that intimal layer and the lumen is much more narrow. Then picture below are some examples of the optic nerve pallor and edema um, that you might expect to see in giant cell arteritis. In terms of epidemiology and etiology, giant cell arteritis is primarily a disease of aging with 80% of cases occurring in adults 70 years or older. Women are at a slightly greater risk than men and um, highest incidence in those, in those of Scandinavian descent, though the diagnosis can be made in any racial group. The etiology is not totally understood, but it's a large to medium vessel vasculitis, thus its association with PMR. And it's thought that some kind of antigen triggers uh, dendritic cells leading to an inflammatory cascade, the release of multiple cytokines, ultimately leading to the intimal hyperplasia and narrow lumen causing uh, the symptoms and, and vision loss. Workup is fairly straightforward. You wanna get a CRP, ESR, and platelets, both are very sensitive markers for inflammation and the temporal artery biopsy is the gold standard for diagnosis. The sensitivity is 77%, the specificity of 98%. There are several um, different diagnostic criteria and calculators you can use, both from rheumatolo rheumatologic side and the ophthalmologic side. The etzel ing GCA prediction model is a pretty good one. It includes a lot of the systemic and ocular um, clinical presentation findings as well as labs. Um, and helps risk stratify patients when the clinical pressure isn't quite as clear and can possibly reduce the need for temporal, unnecessary temporal artery biopsies. Um, it's one of the few that also includes diplopia um, in, uh, in the workup, uh, which is something that the rheumatologic ones don't do. Standard of care is steroids. Um, IV or PO, there's no strong evidence either way, but common practice is to start IV treatment if there are signs of threatened vision, as was done in our patient. Um, regardless of route, early treatment has the greatest impact uh, on outcomes, and this played a pretty significant role uh, in our patient's ultimate outcome that we'll see. Some other things to keep in mind that are important to think about when uh, considering giant cell arteritis, the systemic symptoms, headache, that temporal headache, jaw claudication is very common and very specific, uh, though it wasn't seen in our patient, a history of PMR, throat, tongue pain, even tongue necrosis can be seen constitutional symptoms like malaise and fever our patient had, weight loss and anorexia also can be seen in the temporal artery beating or prominence. On the ocular side, APD is common, the chalky white disc edema that we saw, hemorrhages can also be seen, diplopia, decreased color vision, transient vision loss, cranial neuropathies and visual field defects can all be seen and should be considered um, and um, tested when working up giant cell arteritis. Uh, so back to our patient, he was admitted and started on IV steroids. Um, as well as several adjuvant therapies, including IV heparin, which had to be transitioned to Lovenox injections due to a supra-therapeutic supra PTT. 
He's also started on pitoxypiline and bromonidine drops. Despite three days of this maximal treatment, his visual acuity continued to decrease from counting fingers uh, to NLP, which uh, in both eyes, which as you can imagine, is a very uh, devastating outcome for the patient, his family, and uh, also for the team. Um, in the aftermath of this diagnosis and um, outcome, and as this patient was kind of grappling with his new reality, both him and his wife used the phrase shoulda, coulda, woulda multiple times as they thought about the month leading up to being diagnosed and the multiple times that they thought about seeking care, but ultimately did not. Um, all of their symptoms, all of his symptoms, they kind of excused away due to some other aspect of his medical history. So like the headache and diplopia they thought might be from the headache or from the car accident, uh, which the head CT was normal. So they thought everything's fine. This is just a temporary thing. Um, the graying vision they thought might be from his AMD. The systemic symptoms are from his PMR, maybe we're going too low on the opioid or uh, from the steroid dose. Um, and then the fact that opioids helped relieve his headache a little bit also led to the delays in care um, when they were considering going to the emergency department. Um, all these things highlight the fact that um, educating patients on some of these red flag symptoms is uh, critical importance. I want to take these last couple of minutes to talk about the role of anticoagulation in the treatment of giant cell arteritis. The rationale is somewhat straightforward. Um, thrombocytosis is common giant cell arteritis. Uh, elevated anticardiolipin antibody is also seen, which can lead to a hypercoagulable state. And just the fact that 30% of eyes treated with IV steroids still lose two or more lines of visual acuity, suggesting that perhaps steroids aren't providing adequate coverage. Um, the decision to start heparin in our patient in part was based on a case study from Buono and others in 2004. This is a case where a patient had uh, biopsy proven giant cell arteritis in the right eye, was on steroids for three days, was NLP, then started heparin with bridge to warfarin. Um, and then by day 15, his visual acuity was back almost to baseline. Um, his optic nerve pallor and edema also improved and the pulsatility index also improved. Pulsatility index is a measurement of the resistance of flow in a blood vessel. Um, and here they looked at the central retinal artery. So you can see after they started heparin around day five or six, and then warfarin on day eight, um, the pulsatility index decreased dramatically, indicating that blood flow uh, was uh, had returned to that central retinal artery. Ultimately, warfarin was not started in our patient due to unfavorable risk-benefit ratio. And just the fact that Despite three days of anticoagulation, his visual acuity decreased, did not improve like the patient in the case study. And finally, he was discharged on an oral steroid, tocolizumab and bromonidine, and we'll have follow-up with our normal ophthalmology team as well as rheumatology here at the university. So in summary, uh, this is an extremely potentially devastating diagnosis that we all need to be aware of. Um, older adults with classic symptoms of temporal artery headache, claudication, then the dis distribution of the carotid arteries, and history of PMR are all high suspicion for giant cell arteritis. Um, simple but powerful, begin steroid treatments before the results of the temporal artery biopsy come back if the clinical suspicion is strong enough. And uh, you can consider therapy with adjuvants uh, as appropriate. And then always, always, always take the time to educate uh, our patients on red flag symptoms that uh, they need to be aware of so there aren't delays uh, in seeking care. Um, special thanks to Dr. P and the rest of the neuro ophthalmology team uh, Jordan and Dr. Mike Burrow and Dr. Jardine for uh, this really uh, interesting case. I can, I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Any questions? Great. All right, thank you so much, Michael. Um, okay. Um, next we have Andrew DeLaurier. Um, Andrew is a fourth year medical student who's um, coming here all the way from University of Vermont, Larner College of Medicine. Um, and Andrew here used to have, I think one of the coolest jobs I've ever heard of. Um, he was a member of a hot air balloon chase crew which involved uh, catching ropes thrown over by the pilot in order to safely bring balloons to the ground. Very cool. 
Um, Andrew's presentation is titled Eyes in the Crowd, Early Identification of Retinal Disease with Fundus Camera-Based Nurse-Driven Screening Programs in Kumasi, Ghana. Thanks, Ashley. So my name is Andrew Delorier. I'm a fourth year medical student at the University of Vermont. And I just completed a research year working on global health initiatives with the Himalayan Cataract Project under the mentorship of Dr. Jeff Taven. Today, I'll be discussing one of the projects that I worked on, which was developing a fundus camera-based screening program for diabetic retinopathy and sickle cell retinopathy in Kumasi, Ghana. Uh, these are my disclosures. So I spent 10 months living in Kumasi, Ghana over the past year. And most days I would go into the Confanoche Teaching Hospital Eye Center, which is on the bottom right here. Uh, and I'd like to mention that this eye center probably would not exist had it not been for the initial connection formed by Dr. Alan Crandall and all of the incredible work that he did in Ghana. So I feel very fortunate to be rotating at the institution where he practiced. On the bottom uh, left is myself and Dr. Akwesi Ahmed. He was my primary in-person mentor over the course of the year, and I worked very closely with him. He is a vitroretinal surgeon um, in Kumasi and the only vitroretinal surgeon north of the capital city of Accra. At the top is some of our team. Dr. Jeff Tabin is uh, right of center in the green scrubs. He was my mentor for the year. And then Arthur Brandt is next to him. He's a resident at Stanford with whom I worked very closely over the course of the year. So this is a patient who I met early on during my time in Ghana. He's a 31 year old male who is a single father, and he came in about a month after complete loss of vision in one eye. He actually presented to his local eye care provider, an optometrist, just a few days after losing vision. However, it took him a month before he reached Confinoche Teaching Hospital, where there are retina specialists who could evaluate uh, his pathology. He was diagnosed with proliferative sickle cell retinopathy in both eyes and uh, a combined tractional and regmatogenous retinal detachment in the eye in which he had lost vision. He came in thinking he would receive some sort of treatment that would restore his vision, but he was told not only was it unlikely he would regain vision in the eye that he had lost vision in, but his only uh, remaining eye was now at risk of uh, vision loss from proliferative disease. He was devastated by this news. He is the sole caregiver for his daughter who is under the age of 10. And he said, if he lost vision in what is now his only eye, there's no way in which he could support himself and his daughter. They really had no safety net. So how could this have been prevented? Uh, unfortunately, I met many patients like this man uh, during my time in Ghana, patients with diabetic retinopathy, sickle cell retinopathy, and a host of other conditions who would really only present once they had developed uh, decreased vision to a point that it severely interfered with their daily activities. And in many cases, this was after they had developed irreversible vision loss. I discussed this with Dr. Akwesi Ahmed, Arthur Brandt, the resident from Stanford, and Dr. Tabin. And Arthur Brandt and Dr. Akwesi Ahmed had already sort of discussed the idea of fundus camera-based screening for diabetic retinopathy in Kumasi. And we felt that while I was in Ghana for a year and had time to work on this project, this would be a good opportunity to implement a screening program for diabetic retinopathy and to see if we could do so for sickle cell retinopathy. So diabetes and sickle cell disease probably represent the two leading causes of uh, retinal blindness in Ghana for which there are prophylactic treatments. Diabetes affects 6.5% of the population and sickle cell disease affects 2% of the population. And there are no screening programs for uh, retinal screening programs for retinal complications of either disorder. About 50% of patients with sickle cell disease develop some form of retinopathy. And we conducted a retrospective chart review in Dr. Akwesi Ahmed's retina clinic, looking at 100 consecutive patients coming into the clinic. About 75% were returned, 25% were new patients. And uh, for each patient, we looked at best corrected visual acuity over the course of an entire year from presentation. And in that sample of 100 patients, sickle cell retinopathy was actually the leading cause of both bilateral and unilateral blindness. Now, we are currently expanding on that to a larger sample size and uh, focusing just on new patients to get a little bit of a cleaner picture, but it certainly is evident right now that sickle cell retinopathy is a major cause of blindness in Ghana and is worth screening for. 
So how to screen. Um, focusing on diabetes, the catchment area for Confonoche Teaching Hospital is 10 million patients. Uh, that's over a half a million patients with diabetes, which is far too many for the two retina attendings in Kumasi to screen. There are about 20 trainees at Confonoche Teaching Hospital, residents and intern level trainees um, who could potentially help with screening, but that's still far too many patients. Deep learning and AI models have gained a lot of traction and we are excited to work with something like this in the future at some point, hopefully. However, at present, we felt that human grading is at least on par with these models and uh, it was really too expensive for us to implement um, in a screening program of our scale. So is there anybody else? The one group that there are a lot of in Ghana actually are nurses. Uh, due to the economic situation in the country right now, uh, many nurses are either working part-time and looking for more work or are currently looking for work. And there have been a number of studies uh, in Canada, the UK and elsewhere, looking at training nurses to essentially run every component of a screening program for diabetic retinopathy. So we felt we could develop a screening model where nurses who are trained to image and grade uh, would form really the backbone of the program. So there are a lot of steps that went into developing this model. I've sort of summarized them into six steps here. And the first of those was to develop the model, get buy-in and find personnel. So we met with administration at Confanoche Teaching Hospital, and uh, we were given permission to use a space actually in the diabetes clinic um, to set up a camera and image patients, which is very convenient. We're focusing a lot on diabetic retinopathy initially, and um, this allows us to screen patients at their normal diabetes center visits. We're even able to charge patients a small amount about what they'd pay for diabetic foot care. And the hospital will take a portion of that, but we'll actually get some of that back as well to continue funding this screening site, which is excellent because it should help with long-term long, uh, sustainability and longevity. We then had to acquire the cameras. So the cameras we're using are three Nethra Classic HD cameras, which we felt um, represented the most affordable and reliable option for us to use. And then we had to train our photographers and imagers. So uh, we trained two nurses from the diabetes center. They uh, both had additional time in their schedule and were very excited about this program. Uh, we imaged with them for a while and then, and now they've been imaging on their own and we review the quality of the images and uh, they're both very good. And then we also had them take a grading course offered through uh, the NHS. And this uh, course provided them with a certificate after completing an exam at the end of the course. And um, it just allowed us to make sure that there was um, a certain standard of grading before we started having them grade images. Currently, all the images are still being overgraded by the retina specialists in Kumasi. Um, the nurses and the retina specialists are using the form on the right. But Right now, what we're doing is comparing nurse grading to the retina attendings grading with a study in, including 500 patients. We've already imaged these patients and uh, at present, the nurses are grading the images. We'll compare them with the retina attendings grading. And hopefully, if we're able to show uh, that the nurses are proficient in grading, they'll be able to take over first pass grading in the future. Sickle cell retinopathy is a little bit less straightforward than diabetic retinopathy. Um, there currently are no uh, screening protocols available um, or fundus camera based screening protocols. Many uh, authors in the literature suggest using wide field cameras. The initial lesions in sickle cell retinopathy occur in the periphery. So a wide field camera is optimal to pick up those lesions. However, many places with a high burden of sickle cell disease uh, may not have funds available to purchase a wide field camera, especially not just for screening purposes. Um, in Kumasi, there is no wide field camera available for imaging uh, for academic purposes or anything else. So we, we thought we could develop a protocol by which a standard field camera could be used to screen for sickle cell retinopathy. And we based this protocol off of a paper describing imaging peripheral lesions with a standard field uh, camera for fluorescein angiography in sickle cell patients and felt that based on, uh, on that evidence that it can, you essentially can get far enough out into the periphery, we decided to try this for ourselves. Uh, we developed a, a gaze target for patients to look at that attaches to the camera can be easily recreated. And in a small sort of case series of patients, we found that we were indeed able to pick up 
early lesions of sickle cell retinopathy uh, using a protocol involving two shots of the posterior pole and then images in all eight directions of gaze. Uh, the sensitivity and specificity were quite good for this small sample, and we were even able to retain most of the sensitivity and specificity when focusing just on the temporal periphery, uh, which speeds up the imaging process quite a bit and may be what we move towards in the future. So we felt like that was good enough evidence to run a larger study. Uh, so far, we've enrolled 70 and image 79 out of 200 patients, and we will be comparing grading from our 10 field protocol to the gold standard, which is a dilated fundus exam and indirect exam by a retina specialist in Kumasi. So I wanted to mention briefly that we've also done a lot of work with increasing awareness and developing a referral network. This is really where we're focusing right now and uh, have plans for the future. And uh, our next steps are to monitor, make sure the quality is good enough and hopefully to scale and expand. We've actually opened a second imaging site which allows us to refer patients from the community. They don't, um, it's, it's a little hard to get patients into Kung Fu Noche Teaching Hospital Diabetes Center unless they're already patients there. And uh, this is actually our imager at, at, at the first independent site. And then we formed a Ghanaian NGO called the Africa Eye Imaging Center, uh, which is run by Dr. Akwesi Ahmed. And this will oversee the creation of further sites and hopefully at some point a, a treatment center. These are my acknowledgments. Uh, Dr. Jeff Tabin was my mentor for the year. Dr. Akwesi Ahmed, also a mentor for the year. Arthur Brandt at Stanford, who I worked very closely with, and then many others um, in the US, and then many um, in our, on our gr growing Ghanaian team. I'll take any questions. Thank you. The talks have all been um, exceptional. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I have, I have a few questions. Uh, do, I, do they have any sense right now of how many patients that go through the diabetic clinic are getting eye exams? So we don't know what percentage are getting eye exams. Um, with, to a varying degree, they are being referred for eye exams. However, um, at least in we, we ran one small study looking at high-risk diabetics. It was about 100 patients. And we asked the endocrinologists to refer to us their high-risk patients. Um, and we found eight with proliferative diabetic retinopathy within that group, and none had received um, PRP treatment or prophylactic laser treatment, um, which they would have received had they been referred either to the Kofanoche Teaching Hospital Eye Center or somewhere else. Yeah, and then another question, there's... Yeah, you know, I'm really interested in the implementation of this. We, we see a lot in global eye health, a lot of screening programs. There's still a lot of talk and buzz around AI and its potential for scalability. And, you know, you're, you're working in one site with one uh, single, you know, incredible and capable retina specialist. But as you now look at the funneling of patients, uh, and the potential volumes that would be coming in, what do you see as the challenges to implementing this program in the next one to two years? And do you feel that AI will ultimately have to be implemented to be able to scale the screening? Or do you feel like in this model, you've got enough human resources with nurses where you can do the screening without that? So uh, in this model, assuming that the nurses are able to grade proficiently and uh, continue imaging proficiently and that future nurses that we train will be able to do the same, we feel that for the foreseeable future, uh, paying the nurses competitively in Ghana is actually probably less expensive than um, the cost of AI implementation. We weren't able to find any models where it would be less than a dollar per patient and um, without paying the nurses a lot more than they would make otherwise. They, we're able to, we should be able to, to expand the program and um, pay people fairly, but also um, keep the cost low to patients. The goal is sustainability. And so we'd like to have the cost that patients pay for imaging and eventually for treatment, if we're able to open a treatment center to continue funding the program. So you talk a lot about aware, or lack of awareness of these diseases there. How are you going to try to combine this with screening either a hemoglobin A1C or sickle cell screening? Um, you know, how would that how would that fit together with your um, with your uh, 
photographic screening as well. Thanks. Um, so we've considered, um, at least we've, we've focused on um, screening for sickle cell disease because many patients uh, may not be aware uh, whether or not they actually have sickle cell disease. And the cost of mass screening is, is likely for uh, sickle cell disease and then also for um, hemoglobin A1Cs is probably more expensive than it would cost for us to image patients. And it's sort of a larger problem that we're hoping to see some progress made towards in the future. We're considering um, school-based screening for sickle cell disease in which we would try to get essentially grant funding to fund a pilot project where we may be um, doing uh, genotype screening. However, um, that's all still uh, very preliminary at this point. You may have mentioned this, but how does it function once uh, the photos are showing that someone has diabetic retinopathy or sickle cell retinopathy? How is the system working to getting the patient actually to see the eye specialist? So right now, uh, what we're doing is we have contact information for all of our patients and um, cell phone contact does work pretty well in Ghana. And so patients who need treatment or uh, more regular follow-up are being referred to the Confanoche Teaching Hospital Eye Center. Uh, at present, the volume has not substantially kind of overwhelmed that clinic. However, um, as soon as possible, we're exploring the idea of creating an independent center that is able to offer treatment. Um, that'll be run by Dr. Akwesi Ahmed and hopefully um, other ophthalmologists. And uh, for the time being, potentially retina fellows will help there as well and trainees under the guidance of Dr. Kwesi Ahmed, similarly to how the eye center functions. We have a comment on chat. So the question is, uh, does CATH or Confanoche Teaching Hospital have an established protocol for follow-up and treatment of identified sickle cell retinopathy? And I'm not aware of a protocol that's sort of written in the books anywhere. However, Dr. Akwesi Ahmed and Dr. Amos Akins, who's a medical retina specialist at CATH, um, will essentially determine the follow-up period based on the pathology that they see. So for patients requiring uh, urgent treatment, they try to deliver that treatment as soon as possible. For patients uh, with currently non-treatable disease, they'll, prob they'll scale the follow-up to uh, the degree of pathology. Thank you very much. Great job, Andrew. Okay. All right. Last but not least, we have Ola Lua Omatoa. Um, Ola is a fourth year medical student also here at University of Utah School of Medicine. Um, a fun fact about Ola is that he can solve a Rubik's cube and he's working towards a goal of being able to solve it in under a minute. Um, Ola is going to present a case titled bilateral exudative retinal detachment in a pediatric patient. So I did bring my Rubik's Cube with me. So if there are any professionals in the audience, I would love to exchange any tips, tricks that you may have to get me to my under minute goal. Right now I'm at two minutes, so I have a ways to go. So this case came our way back in January. There was a four-year-old patient who was presented to an outside hospital with progressive ataxia, bilateral facial weakness and ptosis consistent with Bell's palsy. And she was found mostly drinking fluids. Outside hospital CT showed ventricle megaly and a brainstem glioma, prompting an urgent referral to primary children's neurosurgery consult service. Lifelight documentation revealed that she was normal tensive with a blood pressure of 94 or 58, and she was noted as having a normal mental status. 
Upon arrival to Primary Children's, her gait became progressively ataxic. She developed right ear pain and had occasional episodes of emesis prompting an urgent MRI. When she laid flat to prepare for her MRI, her blood pressure spiked to, with systolics in the 180s. Blood pressure was controlled following an 18 milligram dose of IV labetalol and a 1.5 microgram per kilogram per hour drip of nicardipine, which normalized her blood pressure to 138 over 100. She was subsequently intubated and taken for an emergent external ventricular drain placement. Ocular findings of bilateral retinal hemorrhages, ocular findings of bilateral retinal hemorrhages prompted a consult from the ophthalmology service. Upon further questioning, past medical history revealed placental abruption re resulting in an extended stay in the neonatal intensive care unit. While she was in the NICU, she had a seizure. She was edematous and she was hypertensive, requiring antihypertensive medications. In addition, she was found to have hypothyroidism, a diagnosis of Bell's palsy at the age of one and suspected albinism as well. Furthermore, her home blood pressure medications were required in order to maintain her blood pressures between the 130s and the 140s. Pertinent eye exam findings revealed that she, her visual acuity, she was not blinking to light bilaterally. Additionally, visual fields showed that she had not reacted to visual stimuli in the periphery of either eye. Her dilated fundus exam or apologies, her dilated fundus exam showed that she had an irregular contour with peripapillary subretinal creamy infiltrates and her maculas were detached bilaterally. Additionally, her vessels were detached bilaterally as well. And the periphery showed that she had bilateral diffuse exudative retinal detachments. An extensive lab workup was conducted to try and get to the bottom of this patient's overall uh, presentation. However, the lab workup was largely unremarkable. Imaging obtained showed from the OCT on the following day of the right eye demonstrated an inferior serious retinal detachment sparing the macula with optic disc edema. And in the left eye, we see serious retinal detachment with macular involvement also with optic disc edema. Color fundus showed bilateral serious retinal detachments, peripapillary cotton wool spots, with full detachment of the macula in the left eye, as well as Elschnick spots in the periphery bilaterally as well. And a B scan was also obtained. The fluorescence angiograph showed patchy choroidal filling with scattered nonspecific hypofluorescent lesions with late hyperfluorescent lesions seen bilaterally as well. Looking at exudative detachments in general, there are three different flavors. You can have a retin retinogenous retinal detachment. Retin apologies. You can have a tractional retinal detachment. You can have an exudative retinal detachment, and then you have a, can have a regitamous retinal detachment as well. Retinal detachments can have when they are tractional, they occur because of a fibro a fibrovascular scar occurs that pulls traction on the retina. When it is exudative in nature, fluid accumulates between the neurosensory layer as well as the retinal pigment epithelial as well. The causes of bilateral exudative attachments in, uh, in ex of the exudative flavor happens when fluid accumulates between the neurosensory layer for one of three reasons. Either you have too much fluid being produced or not enough fluid being excreted by the retinal pigment epithelium or you can have a combination of one of the first two reasons. After difficult follow-up, she was seen months later at a Nevada pediatric office, and it was noted that her retinas were reattached, and there was a resolution of her creamy infiltrates. Notably, her right eye had 2300 vision, and her left eye had 2200 vision with optic nerve pallor bilaterally. In general, what this case demonstrates is the need for eye care providers to consider rare causes of retinal detachments in patients with bilateral exudative retinal detachments. Increase awareness of malignant hypertensive sequela, malignant hypertension sequela amongst healthcare professionals is essential to ensure timely interventions and to prevent irreversible vision loss in children with bilateral exudative attachments. 
The authors are led to believe that because her retinals were found reattached after the aggressive and prompt control of her blood pressure, her retinal detachments were most likely due to malignant hypertension. These are my overall resources for this presentation. And I would truly like to acknowledge the authors who contributed to this presentation, uh, reviewed this presentation, and were able to help finalize this overall report. And most of all, I want to give a big thank you to all of Moran. Thank you to the faculty who gave me patience as I honed in on my LAMP exam skills. Thank you to the staff who helped me navigate this building. And thank you to the residents who allowed me to take call, who allowed me to learn from you all in the early morning lectures, and let me use your loops in the operating room. And thank you, everybody here, for the most phenomenal rotation in all of medical school. Thank you. Just more a comment. <clears throat> you know, often uh, <clears throat> we we do, we have a problem in our subspecialties uh, where you know we think of uh, pediatric cases as just little adults. <laughs> it's just way more complex than that. And uh, a lot of these things uh, that can have very important impact on vision can be relatively subtle and often are missed. And uh, we shouldn't expect the average pediatrician will necessarily see this. So we're really fortunate to not only have great retina, but have pediatric retina. And, and now we have uh, pediatric neuro-ophthalmology because that's even more difficult often to figure out exactly what's going on. So... Um, we do a great service by helping our pediatric colleagues because um, uh, I, in my career, I've seen some, I mean, severe retinoblastoma that had clearly been missed in well patient exams for multiple times until it was already a, a significant problem. So anything we can do to help them, they need it. They're like most ophthalmologists. We we used to joke, or most uh, uh, general medical uh, care, primary care, that that in the old days before electronic medical record, when they'd put double ENT down, they put WNL. And we used to joke it really meant we never looked. Right?